so great pleasure to be with you here. So I'm from um, Monash University in Melbourne, Australia. So it's quite been quite a journey and I'm really pleased to be here. Um, so I wanted to just tell you today a bit about um, the work that we've been doing, uh, particularly uh, some user studies looking at 3D printing for accessible graphics. Um, and from that, uh, some suggestions about uh, what are the best um, guidelines and also what are some further areas that need exploration. So it's, it's a very new area, so um, there are lots of areas for exploration. <laughs> so, um, as I said, I'm from Melbourne, um, Monash University Faculty of Information Technology, and our group has, is immersive analytics, so looking at um, conveying information um, immersively, so not just tact tactile, but also a lot of things like um, 3D, oh, not sorry. <laughs> um, virtual reality, that sort of thing. Um, and, and we also have a Sensi Lab maker space with lots of toys to play with, so th lots of 3D printers, um, laser cutter, those sorts of things. And the idea is to do lots of hands-on research. We have about 50 staff and students, um, and we've been working in the accessible graphics field for about 10 years. So it started with um, Gravitas, which is an iPad app, um, to easily create uh, graphics with a, an audio label associated. And there's an image on the screen of a brain um, with audio labels associated with each lobe. Um, I came on to the team after working in um, Braille and tactile graphics production for a long time and to work on a project looking at accessible graphics for vision impaired students in higher education. So looking at what access university students are getting to graphics and different ways that they can get gain better access. And 3D printing was one of the areas that we explored. Um, okay. So looking at the user study. So we've really just done some um, preliminary studies and there, as I said, there's a lot more that we'd like to explore in the future. So we started off just by producing a, a large range of materials and showing them to blind adults. Within the formal study, we had 16 adults with severe vision impairment since childhood. Um, and there were a lot more people that we spoke to more informally. Um, so of those 16, the majority were congenitally blind, um, although some had acquired blindness and, or partial vision. Um, so we had face-to-face -face interviews, semi-structured interviews, and we showed them a range of materials um, and basically talked them through the materials, got their reactions, and then asked some more f um, questions such as whether it was easy to understand, what models did they like, which ones didn't really work, um, what else would they like to see. So on the screen I've got some examples of the materials that we showed. Um, so there's a Tyrannosaurus rex skull. Um, there's also a inner ear with vestibular system, um, and we had some I don't know if I handed around the heart some other anatomy and models as well. Um, there were some geography things. So on the screen, there's a model of um, Mount Everest. And we also had some other mountain types to contrast with that. Uh, there's a topographic map of Australia. Also a map of the US with uh, the height of each state indicating the population density, so it's an information graphic. Um, we also did floor plans, so we've got two different types of floor plans there. Uh, a cityscape, so that's um, New York City with the Twin Towers before the 9-11. Um, and there's also a church. So there was a very wide variety and what we were interested in finding out was um, what people were most interested in, what were they engaged in, what did they learn that was new from the models. Uh, okay, so basically what we found that was that there was a high level of enthusiasm. Um, 
lots of the sessions went for an hour or more and then at the, because people wanted to see every single model that I had um, and then offered to look at more as soon as they were made available. Um, there was also, oh, I forgot to mention as well, sorry, that we, when it was appropriate, we gave not just the 3D model, but also a tactile graphic that corresponded with the model. So for things like the floor plans and the buildings, we were able to do that. Some of the more um, three-dimensional things, like the inner ER, we didn't do as a tactile graphic. Um, and we also counterbalanced, so half of the people I would show the tactile graphic first and the other half would see the 3D model first. Um, so people found that the 3D models were easy to understand um, and more intuitive than the tactile graphics. So we had a comment from someone, um, as a totally blind person, I experienced the world in 3D. Um, it also exposed a lot of gaps in general knowledge um, due to lack of prior access. So things like, um, there were a lot of aha moments where people went, oh, now I understand. Um, so, for example, the Sydney Opera House, um, we're Australian, we should know what that looks like. People had seen s images of it and b been told what it looked like, but still didn't really have an understanding until they felt that three-dimensional model and then understood what it, what it looks like. Um, same with the mountains. So, um, for, for example, Mount Everest, people had not understood that it was a folding mountain and that it was a range of mountains as opposed to just one really tall mountain. So, so some very basic things sh um, showing that there, there hadn't been enough exposure previously uh, without three-dimensional models. Um, also, when we did have the tactile graphic alongside the three-dimensional model, the three-dimensional model helped people to understand the tactile graphic. Um, so we also gained some insights in terms of what we should do for when we're designing three-dimensional models. Um, so obviously, I think you covered a few of these. <laughs> We've probably got a few areas of overlap. Um, so gaps obviously need to be wide, large enough for fingers. And we had, because we were working with adults, we had to have quite large gaps in some cases. Um, also, the building heights, when we were looking at streetscapes or cityscapes, um, the height of things needs to be low enough so that you can reach your fingers over the top and get to the bottom of the, the graphic easily. Um, and so relative height was important, but the actual height was not so, if that makes sense. So the buildings didn't have to be super tall, but if one was taller than the other, then you needed to represent that. Um, Braille printed on the side, we've already covered that. <laughs> um, and also the This Way Up, we've covered that as well, so it's good. <laughs> so um, one of the things about the 3D models is obviously that it's something that you pick up and turn around and explore from every angle, um, as opposed to a tactile graphic which stays on the page, so the, the directionality is very important for it. Okay, so the next area that we looked at was um, talking with educators. So the same objects that we showed to blind adults, we also showed to vision specialist support teachers who are working directly with students and also to producers who are creating materials for vision impaired students. And we wanted to know what they would like to use 3D printing for and how practical they thought it would be for them to implement within a school or within the workplace. Um, we also had a small um, project with Insight Education Centre for the Blind and Vision Impaired. So they have a small number of students at their school and also a outreach program. So they Bus, uh, bus around their materials and teach students within mainstream schools. Um, and we worked with them to identify what sort of objects they would like to have um, produced um, for, for the curriculum and also for teaching life skills. And we trained their staff in the production of 3D printed materials. So we started off that we would produce the materials and they would try it out. And they're now at the point where they're just off and running and doing it all themselves. 
Um, and lastly, in the project that I uh, was working on with vision impaired students in higher education, we had some pilot studies where we were looking at all of their study materials and how they could access those materials. So 3D printing was an option for those students. Um, we didn't have any students studying STEM subjects, uh, but we did find that um, the three the campus map was a, a really important area for them, so we were able to provide that in the 3D. Um, and it expo again exposed a lot of areas where they had a lack of knowledge. So, for example, didn't know that uh, a whole section of the university existed or uh, didn't realise that two buildings were connected. So they'd been going out of a building and then back in to another connected building and they could have taken a shorter route. But it wasn't until they had access to the, the models that they were able to learn those things. Um, okay, so in terms of the findings, um, there was definite um, desire from the educators to use 3D models in order to teach going from a three dimension to two dimensions of tactile graphic. Um, and then there are also a, just a small proportion, but an important proportion of graphics that are inherently three dimensional that were not being produced at all for students because they couldn't be represented in 2D, but they can be represented as a 3D model. Um, and the other thing that was interesting was that um, the, the models that, or, and the maps that we were creating were appealing to not just the touch readers but also to their peers. So it encourages um, inclusivity. So it's something that everyone can use, not just a special product for the blind student. Um, and I've talked a bit about 3D maps for orientation and mobility as well. Okay. Right, so the third study, um, which is not yet published, but I can give you details. <laughs> um, so basically we were wanted to do a direct comparison of maps in two dimensions, so as a tactile graphic versus in three dimensions. Um, and we wanted to look at maps because um, it's an area where I know that I was originally skeptical about the value of 3D printing because a, um, the, the tactile graphic is very similar to the print. Um, it's a top-down view and it's, I, I thought that raising it up wouldn't actually help much. Um, but we needed to prove that or otherwise. Um, so we had 12 adult touch readers um, who were divided into groups that were matched for age, um, vision and experience, prior experience and confidence with graphics. And um, three quarters of them had already had some experience with 3D models because they were involved in the first study, <laughs> um, but not much beyond that. Um, in terms of the materials, we started off with, I think it got handed around actually, there was a little purple map that was a street map, and that was just a practice map that we gave as a tactile graphic and as a 3D model at the same time. Um, just so that people were familiar with what we were talking about and also to encourage them to reach, uh, to touch the sides of objects as well as the tops of objects because it's a different means of exploring a 3D um, map. Um, we didn't have, oh sorry, um, for the test materials, we had a tactile graphic and a 3D model of a park and a train station. So the parks were fairly simple, whereas the train stations were more complex with a bridge going over the railway lines. Um, and we had two different, um, two different parks, two different train stations, and then we were able to um, counterbalance the order that everyone received or uh, what model they received. We didn't have any labels on the tactile graphics or on the 3D models um, and that actually helped us in order to tell what people understood or didn't. So we asked them if you are not sure of something then ask. So for example they'd say is this a tree um, and if they didn't know at all then they would need to ask in order to get the meaning of the object. Um, 
we also measured the time that they spent exploring the graphic and we asked them questions to measure how well they understood the graphic and also the accuracy of the mental model that they'd been able to build up. Um, and what we found was that the 3D models were preferred in terms of the way that people responded. Um, we did have some people who said that they preferred the tactile graphic and those were the people who were not able to answer the questions as well. So it's almost as though the tactile graphic had less information and was simpler, so they preferred it for that. That's a, that's a guess, but um, it was an interesting observation. Um, we also found that the 3D icons were a lot more intuitive and easy to understand. So working with the 3D model, people um, could, could understand what the icons meant without needing to ask as often. Um, also, we we're very interested in looking at the way that people explored. Um, so, s people who were, did a full scan of the tactile graphic first and then went to detail were performing better on the tasks. Um, with a 3D model, they needed to use a totally different strategy because you can't scan over objects that are, are raised up. So there was that training component of um, know five minutes. <laughs> knowing to, to feel down to the sides of things and putting your hands on top first and then exploring in a s more systematic way. Um, so I think if we are moving to 3D models more, we need to keep in mind that there's a, a different, um, different technique that needs to be taught. Okay. I think we've covered a bit of this already, which is excellent. <laughs> um, so in terms of suggested objects for 3D printing, um, 3D shapes is an obvious area. So when we're teaching geometry, um, also so higher maths and physics are areas where there are a lot of 3D um, images that are best represented as a 3D model. Um, also for teaching perspective. So there's a, a, an image there of a question for a young student asking, a, a, so it shows the top view and the front view of a building and then it asks what could be the side view of the building and that's something that would be incredibly difficult to teach um, just as a tactile but a 3D was very quick to produce and gives all of that richness of um, teaching. Um, also for place, so maps, buildings, floor plans, uh, geography, landforms, topography and information graphics, um, biology, so things like internal structures, microscopic structures and animals and bones, things that you can't readily touch. Um, I'm not a proponent for printing something that you can actually just go out and buy from the store. <laughs> Um, and also classroom tools, we found this with the Insight Education that we ended up producing not just materials for the curriculum but other little things like um, braille, Lego blocks with the not all six dots, just dots for the braille or um, braille building blocks, those sorts of materials and, and just practical things like a magnifier stand. Um, two minutes? That's right, it's going to work. <laughs> okay. Um, sort of going to work. <laughs> All right, the other area we we're looking at was labelling. So again, there's problems in terms of, um, we would all know for a tactile graphic that it's difficult to find enough space to put the braille labels on. When you're working with a three-dimensional model, that problem is even greater. Um, so you can have braille, stick on braille, maybe screen printed braille or 3D printed braille. Um, verbal descriptions were essential in the work that we were doing, but it's not always going to be possible. Um, so then there's a whole range of possibilities for attaching audio labels electronically. And the Australian topography that I handed around, I haven't got the audio attached because I didn't want it firing off while <laughs> I was talking. Um, but I can plug it in and it's got little touch points um, so that you can listen to the, the labels as well as having the braille labels on there. Um, and it was homemade. <laughs> um, nearly done. Okay. So... Advantages for 3D printing, it gives us a better understanding of the objects that are inherently 3D. 
and it can be used to teach from 2D to 3D um, and inclusive. I think those are the biggest advantages. Um, some areas for development, as I said, the labelling is an issue. The bulkiness of the items is definitely something that puts people off um, and it's so it's not going to be um, used for every textbook because they won't fit in. <laughs> um, the time needed to um, print materials is an issue, so you can't do things at the last minute. Most of the objects that I've handed around would have taken between two to ten hours to print. And she's going to kick me off, oh my goodness. And we need standards and guidelines, so I'd really love to talk to people about your findings as well, and we need to pull that knowledge so that we can develop some guidelines. Great, okay, Th thank, thank you, you very much. <laughs> 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 and as the next speaker is getting ready, I think we have time for just a, a few questions. While you're thinking of your questions, I'd like to present. Thank with you. A, a gift from the I just wonder if you Too have much. any kind of guidelines. <laughs> I just wonder if you have any kind of guidelines for the different types of graphics. The question was, are there guidelines for the different types of graphics? There's no. So this is what we all need to work on, I think, um, is to pull that knowledge so that we can... Um, so I can... We had some some guidelines that we developed just informally in terms of the heights of things and the width of things in order that to get access with your fingers. And of course that's going to change whether you're working with children or adults as well. So um, it's a really big area for exploration, I think. Great, thank you very much. Okay, thank you. <laughs>